I was born in Gulfport, Mississippi, but I got to Texas fast. My father was a welder. He came uh, here uh, to get work uh, while they were building the ship channel, the refineries along the ship channel. So we lived in Pasadena on Taylor Street. After a couple of years, we moved to Harrop Street. I was about six by then. Uh, our house was a block or so from the Second Baptist Church in Pasadena where my mom, brother, and I attended. My dad was not active in the church. I recall a time aligned with the tradition of the church back then that each worship, each worship service and message by the pastor concluded with a strong invitation to come down front and ask Jesus in your life. It was every service that went that way. One Sunday, I felt the time was right for me to make that decision and to step forward, and I went down and publicly accepted uh, the, provision, the God's provision for me. The thing I remember most is that within a few days of my decision, I was asking, maybe pushing, my friend across the street to make the same decision and not understanding why he did not feel the same urgency that I did. But I don't remember there was a, a baptism associated with it. I was, what, maybe somewhere around seven, eight years old at the time. Um, but nevertheless, my mom, brother, and I were active members of the church there at Second Baptist as I was growing up. Somewhere around the time I was in the fifth grade, the family moved to Willow Street. About this same time, before we moved, the Harrop Street neighborhood was beginning to change. I was starting to get into altercations with others my age in the neighborhood. It just seemed that that was the way you expressed who you were and you know, what you wanted to be. Uh, in retrospect, that may have had something to do with our move to the Willow Street neighborhood, which was different. There was much more emphasis on, there were uh, sports and academic performance. There were three guys my age that lived in, within a couple of blocks of the house we rented. Although I did not know any of them, two of the three proved later to be accomplished college scholarship winning athletes. And the third was a talented writer. His name was Lynn. The four of us began to operate together as a team. Lynn thought it would be good if we had a go-by name to operate on and suggested we adopt the name the Fearsome Foursome as we operated at Gardens Elementary and Jackson Junior High. Uh, later we changed it to the Ferocious Five when a fifth guy moved into the neighborhood. We did start to run into some problems a year or so later when the sixth guy showed up and somehow we ended up with the name the Sexy Six. <laughs> and we were moving into junior high then. And so it's a new school. The principal didn't think too much of our name, let, let, let alone our group. So things began to take a lower profile and kind of faded away. Uh, as I look back on things that changed, that, that move from Harrop Street to Willow Street changed my whole outlook on what was important about life and what to focus on. Uh, as part of the uh, fearsome foursome, it was how good an athlete you were and your academic performance that made the difference. And it turned out these guys that I was able to join into by the move really were the in crowd as we were going through junior high and then later high school. And I got to be a part of that. As I entered high school, I played all sports, basketball, baseball, football. I played baseball and basketball through the ninth grade and football through my senior year as a second team offensive center. I was not a particularly accomplished athlete. I made the team, but that, not much more than that. But for this move from Harrop Street to Willow Street, I think I would have turned out to be a substantially different person. Uh, 
In those days, First Baptist Church in Pasadena had a practice of hosting a graduation dinner for the seniors on the high school football team. It was held at the church and the guest speaker brought in. For 1968, the graduating dinner speaker was a banjo playing former college basketball star at the University of Houston and later Howard Payne, whose name was Buddy Griffin. Some of you may recognize that name. Uh, he has a pretty wide uh, reputation within the Christian community, largely because of the banjo band and the impression it makes on people. In the next six months after, I, after the banquet, uh, I graduated from high school. I had a sum, summer job as a counselor at Camp Champions on Lake LBJ. Started classes at the University of Houston and also had a part-time job at a manufacturing plant, still living at home. When I returned from my summer job, the same guy from the graduation dinner, Buddy, turns up at, first, at the Second Baptist Church in Pasadena as in charge of the college and careers department. So this guy who was so impressive at the banquet now is my Sunday school teacher. So we did church for a couple of years, but he connected me with some powerful Bible teachers, including Judge Paul Pressler, some of you may recognize that name, by pointing me to various studies, Bible studies and retreats. Then I started to get ready for graduate school and Buddy noticed I was not coming back to church on Sunday evenings, which was the practice in those days. I was still holding down a part-time job going to grad school and I was, uh, would go to church on Sunday morning, then go out to the U of H library, staying until eight or nine o'clock and then come home. Buddy noticed I was not coming back, asked me about it, I explained the situation to him, and um, he uh, followed up uh, several weeks later with the recommendation that I look into Houston's First Baptist, or First Baptist Church, as it was called in that day, that uh, they had a new pastor, a guy named John Lasagno, and things seemed to be going very well at the church, and it's not very far from the U of H campus. Okay, that sounds like something that's worth worth trying. The downtown uh, First Baptist Church building was built in the late 1920s, and the banks financing the construction insisted it be built in a way that it could be converted to a movie theater if things didn't work out. <laughs> as I walked into the, as I made my way into the back of the building that evening service, I noticed the lobby area was separated from the worship area by, by doors with portholes in them. Yes. So you could, you could see what was going on in, in the worship center. Uh, so I made my way over and began to look through the, the door and see and begin to take in what all was going on. As it turns out, it was college and careers weekend. Just happened to be that, that weekend. And they were the people that were on the platform uh, singing. And at that moment, when I was looking through the door, I still have a vivid memory of a Gaither song, Jesus, Jesus, there's something about that name. And time sort of froze for me for a few minutes as I looked around and kind of began to take it all in. Uh, and so I decided at that moment that Buddy was probably right. I should look at spending some more time at First Baptist Church. Uh, again, this is one of those things as I look back over my life, uh, this is one of the things I'm inclined, which makes me inclined to think these things didn't just happen. There was, there was a plan. And um, one of the things that, uh, that I've gotten in the practice of doing when I'm talking to somebody wanting to get to, to know, know them, I will ask the question, what are the, looking back over your life, what are the three or four most important things that, that uh, happened in your life? That if they hadn't happened, you would be a substantially different person, or it's reasonable to think you would be. Hey, and so, as I look back over these things, that's, that's part of what uh, comes to my mind also. These are places where God intervened, connected me, 
with um, people and or circumstances that made a difference in who I turned out to be. Uh, God has used uh, First Baptist Dorothy. Let me get you to... Uh, okay, so I stood at the door, took that in, I started going to the church, and uh, God has used it powerfully in my life. He used it to connect me with multiple gifted Bible teachers and successful, accomplished professionals of all sorts who lived out the Bible in their daily lives and talked about it freely. And this was a critical time in my life. I was starting my professional career also. So the impact of being able to listen to guys face to face who were, you know, years ahead of me in, in the biggest CPA firm in town, there were two or three of those guys that were involved. And again, these were serious, Bible-believing people who walked through life with, with the, walked out the Bible with their life there and freely talked about it. So, um, okay, so I, I, as going through that period of time, after getting connected to First Baptist and beginning to get some of these Bible teaching and connected with some of these people that uh, uh, I could walk through daily life with, I found I was learning enough about Jesus and the salvation plan at this time that I began to rethink the decision I had made as a kid and choose to do it all over again to make sure I was getting it right. And it was such a major decision as, again, the things I had learned from this, these uh, people that I've been um, doing life with now. Uh, made me want to go back and make sure that's this is a major decision make sure that i get this done correct so i did ended up being baptized in the old downtown in the church downtown uh also as it turns out carol and i met there at uh, first baptist on her first day there as she tells the story on her arrival she explained to the lord that that uh, the place was not for her but that she was going to stay through the service because it was such a hard time getting down all the way downtown. That's exactly right. So again, it looks, looking back on it, it seems like maybe there was a plan working out. So uh, in summary, the move from Harrop Street to Willow Street, meeting with and joining what turned out to be the fearsome foursome, crossing paths with and later connecting with Buddy Griffin, who introduced me to First Baptist Church and uh, the network of uh, believers that were there at that at that particular time uh, made was the way God ended up developing me into who I turned out to be. So. Well, I can say that's the most words you'll hear Frank string together ever. <laughs> he is a man of few words. Uh, but when he speaks, he speaks with wisdom. Uh, the only thing I can add to that from my own testimony is that my father was a church planner. My mother was a Bible teacher. I was raised in a very believing home. I was saved when I was seven years old. My dad baptized me in the church. We were there, and I was so short I had to stand on bricks so my head would stand up above the baptistry thing so you could even see me. Um, so I was raised with the Lord in a firm foundation. Uh, when I moved to Houston, though, in 1975, I was single. I had been through a particularly hard time there that you don't have time for, but uh, I had come to a point in my life just before I moved here where I just said to the Lord, Lord, you know, I know you're there. I, I've tried to believe you're not there, and I can't do it. I know you're there, and I you're, know you're there for me, but... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn everything over to you, but you'd better walk with me because I have nothing if you don't take care of me. And I had come to that point. Moved to Houston, looked and looked and looked for churches here. Couldn't find one. Looked and looked for about three weeks. Couldn't find one. Um, and, a, and a former Baptist minister who left the ministry and was now a probation officer at a party at my cousin's house where I lived told me about 
Talawood, Second Baptist, and First Baptist, and suggested I try them because they had big singles groups. Well, my dad was a church planner. I was the singles group, you know. <laughs> so I didn't even know what he meant by a big singles group. But I went to the other two. This was pre-Ed Young days at Second, and I don't even remember who was pastor at Talawood, but I just didn't feel like they were the church for me. So my cousin's husband told me how to drive. We lived in Northwest Houston, down 290 and down I-10 and take Smith Street exit and go down here to First Baptist Church. So I went and I really did walk in that day and looked around and that was a much smaller in this sanctuary we've got now, but massive room to me. And I, I literally walked in and said out loud, Lord, this is, it was a long way down here. This is too big a church for me. I will stay through church. It was pouring rain. And I had learned to drive in Alaska in blizzards. I had not driven in thunderstorms. They were much more scary to me than a snowstorm. And I just said, it's a long way down here, but I'm not staying. Uh, this, this is it. I'm here because I'm here, but I'm going home. Just as it just happened to be the college and career day, the first day Frank walked into First Baptist, it happened to be the singles day, the, way I, the day I walked into First Baptist. Single adult minister was preaching. Single adults were uh, ushering. Um, a lady made me feel really welcome, but the, the usher's chair next to where I sat down, Frank sat down. Uh, so I met him that first day. I had no idea what else was going to happen, but met him that first day. So that's when I first met him. I ended up as the president of women's singles in Merle Jordan's class. He used to sneak in the back of Merle's class to hear her teach. She was that good. Uh, and um, then found out that the president of the men's singles was Frank. So we began to work together then. So that's how we met and how we got together. From then till now, it's been just a, a wonderful story of God's plan for our lives together and for being in this church. And what it has brought, I cannot tell you what it has brought. I could talk all day of the blessings of First Baptist, but when God has a plan, He puts it together. And it's never what you thought it was going to be. You can't figure it out. You might as well save your energy and your thought process because you can't figure it out. But when it happens, it's clear that it's him. So today, we're going to study three of the parables. And I promise to let you out on time, which gives me only about two minutes. But um, we're going to do three of the parables. And we've been studying the parables. And, and so up until now, we've had several of them taught. And we've talked about what... Um, uh, what they could mean, but I want to give you just a little bit of um, warning before we start, and that is that parables are easy to interpret in lots of different ways, okay? And part of the reason is because they don't spell in black and white what they're talking about. They give you something that is an example of the, the truth they're trying to teach. So in the parables, sometimes we want to make them say something that they don't necessarily say, even though it's a good idea and even though it fits in in a nice way, we need to not take them out of context, okay? So within the context of the ones we're doing today, Jesus is teaching kingdom parables, which means parables that have to do with the kingdom of heaven is like, is the way he starts out. So we have to look at them in that context. So one of the important things about that is that if it's in the kingdom of heaven, he is talking about what happens with believers, okay? He's not talking about outside the kingdom, this is the way things is. He's talking about this is the kingdom, and this is the way you enter it, and this is the way you live in it. So I want to teach the point of these parables from that standpoint. I do use a lot of commentaries, uh, commentaries after I've already looked at the passage, and I will tell you that as many commentaries I looked at had that many different opinions, okay? But with the book we're using, after I began to look at what he had to say, and of course he's a long time ago commentator, he's not new, uh, he's way back there, um, but I believe he's, he's right in what he's saying about these parables. So I'm gonna teach it from the point of view that is in the book we're using that he, he teaches from. So the first parable is only, um, it's in Matthew 13. I gotta look, one's only two, one's only two um, verses and one's only one verse. So Matthew 13, 
uh, starting with, uh, I think, verse 44, is it? Yeah, 1344. And in that parable it is called the parable of the hidden treasure. Uh, and so when I was first looking at it, I honestly uh, looked at it from a different point of view, but I, I, I really think that this is right. So starting with verse 44, that one little verse, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Um, the setting would have been understandable to the people listening to Jesus as he was teaching. Now, at this point, he is only talking to the disciples. He's been teaching to a crowd. He's had to get in a boat and get offshore to get because they're pressing in on him so much he can teach. But at this point, when he starts teaching these parables, he's gone inside the house. And his disciples are his audience. They are the ones he's teaching. Those that are already his servants that are following him and walking with him in his ministry. So when he says that the kingdom of heaven uh, is like um, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, they understand from their standpoint what has happened in Jewish history, and that is that if they had something valuable, if they had a treasure, something that was worth more than the everyday stuff. They were invaded so much that a lot of times they would hide the treasure out in the field. And they knew where it was, but it, nobody else knew where it was. And they might even go with the idea that we're going to be invaded, we're going to have to leave, but when we come back, the treasure will still be here. So when Jesus talks to them about it, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, they understand what he's saying. It would be like we hide our things in a, a safe in the house or we find a, a safety deposit box at the bank. We keep those treasures where they're safe. And so he says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. So somebody's put it there to keep it safe, which a man found and covered up. I believe in this parable he's talking about the, the man is Jesus. Now, a lot of people want to talk about the treasure being Jesus, but I believe it's that the man is Jesus, and he is looking at the field. And you can even, and, and this gets a little um, symbolic, but uh, if you look back, one of my major questions about the promised land is God emphasizes more and more and more that the land is important. The people are important. The nation is important. They're his people. He's going to bring the Messiah through. But the land itself is important because he promised Abraham and he promised Isaac and he promised Jacob that they this would be the promised land. This would be his promised place for the nation to grow. And so from the time that Israel became a nation back in Egypt and then they went through the, the wilderness and they ended up, they were always headed toward the promised land. So the land itself held value. So if Jesus is the man that is seeing the treasure, he is looking at the land and he is saying, the treasure's there, you know, and who, what is the treasure? The treasure is actually the coming Messiah, okay? But the treasure is Israel and in the land is God's promise for the answer to the world. And he looks through all of what the Jews have made it, <laughs> and they made it a mess. Uh, he looks through all of the stuff that's there. I've just been teaching Hosea, and God's about to bring judgment and scatter Israel through Assyria because they would not remain faithful to him. But when Jesus looks at that land, he sees the redemption. He sees the people. He sees the church today. And as he sees it, then he doesn't just go get it. It says he, he covered it up. It says he, um, uh, he saw the, the, this man sees this hidden treasure and he hides it again. Well, the picture is Israel is the promised land. The people are the promised people. But God is going to come through the Messiah, and it's not yet. It's a time of waiting. So he lets the treasure sit while he goes and buys, gives up all he's got in order to redeem it for himself. Do you see the picture of Christ? Because what did he give up? He gave up everything. There's a song that says, um, he left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, but he gave, there to lay down his life for me. And if that is a love, the ocean is dry, there's no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then this is a myth. Heaven's a myth. 
There's no feeling like this if that isn't love. His love was enough to not insist on, here I am now, but go do the thing that it would take to redeem mankind. So the treasure sits there, he puts it back, and he gives up heaven in order to buy it for us. He bought the land, and he bought the treasure in the land. Anybody uh, that does any kind of real estate knows that when you buy a house, Part of the contract is anything that's stuck to a wall or a ceiling goes with the house. And you have to stipulate in the contract, no, my curtains aren't going, or they are going with the sale. And so Jesus buys the land because within the land is the hidden treasure. And the hidden treasure is salvation that he's going to bring. So that's my picture of what he's talking about with the hidden treasure. Now the next parable is the parable of... Um, I have to look because I've got three and I've been going through them so much today. Um, the parable of the uh, pearl of great price. There is a particular um, religion today that makes a big deal about the pearl of great price. Um, but, and, and they take a wrong view of what that means. So most people who look at the Pearl of Great Price are going to walk, want to talk about the Pearl also again as being uh, Jesus. But I think he's the merchant. Okay? Because what it says is, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. It is tied to the parable before it. It is Jesus himself. And the pearl he finds of great price that's worth giving up his life for, it's that valuable, is the church. It is those that will be redeemed. It is the church that will be part, is in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like Jesus who redeemed us in the kingdom of heaven. So uh, there's a lot more I could say about pearl of great price. I've got it here, but I'm out of time. So I'm going to go on to the debt. But... Um, we want to, you can interpret both of these parables as Jesus being the hidden treasure and Jesus being the pearl. And that's okay if you do. But if you take it out of context, you have to take it out of context to do that. Because within the context, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And he is talking about what it is like and what do we know about the kingdom of heaven. No man enters except by me. We know that he is the way to the kingdom of heaven. He is the seeker. Long before we knew him, he sought us, and he bought us, and we're his, and we live in the kingdom. So I like both those. Then we're going to switch to Matthew 18 uh, and the uh, parable of debt. And I found this interesting. In fact, I texted to Butch because um, he had sent me the three, and he said the, the, the parable of debt. But in the book, he talks about a different parable, and I thought maybe he got his words mixed up to it, and he went back and said, no, we're talking about the parable of debt. Um, or the unforgiving, the other word for it is the unforgiving servant. And it starts in verse 21 of Matthew 18. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy seven times or 70 times seven. Uh, I can remember saying to my mother one day as I was growing up, how come Jesus said that we're to forgive 70 times seven? That's a lot of times. She said, yeah, more than anybody can do, right? It's, it's a lot of times to forgive somebody. When Peter asked that question of Jesus, the rabbinical rule was three times. So it was going beyond that and asking if you should forgive him seven times. But Jesus comes back and says, no, not seven, 70 times seven, a number you'll never reach. You're supposed to forgive without any exception continually throughout your life, is what he's saying. So, and then he goes on to say, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was bought, brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let me tell you that 10,000 talents was, I've got, um, it's really interesting. 10,000 talents was like um, 6,000 6, denarii made 10,000 talents, and a denarii was one day's wages. Okay, so it took 6,000 of them to make one talent, and this guy owes this man 
10,000 of those. So if you multiply that, he owes him 160,000 years work. So what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of heaven is like this guy who the king is owed 10,000 talents. He owes the king more than he could ever in any way possibly pay, ever. There's that little song, he owed a debt. He did not owe, I, I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And so I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. If the king is Jesus in this story, the servant that owes him um, wages owes him the work of 160,000 years. Do you have even in the Old Testament anybody that lived 160,000 years who was the oldest man? He was much, uh, he was under 1,000 years. So you start out reading this parable and you realize that if Jesus is the king and this guy owes him that, he owes him the impossible to pay back. So the servant, uh, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. It was common in that day when you were selling someone into slavery to sell the whole family. Um, so the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. That was a promise he could not pay. And as we apply that to today's world to the lost and they need to understand that it is a debt they cannot pay. They can't pay it then they have to come to that point of humbling themselves and falling on their knees. This guy said, I, if, if you just have patience, I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He didn't, he didn't charge anything to his account. He wiped the books clean on his account. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love somebody to wipe your, your mortgage off the books or wipe your whatever other debt? You just wipe it clean and set you free. So he says no. He says okay. Uh, he released him and forgave him from the debt. So the guy walked out of there feeling pretty good I would think. But when that same servant went out he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him he began to choke him saying pay what you owe. This guy only owed him a hundred denarii. That's a hundred days work. That was a possible payment. If you'd taken, the guy could reasonably think I can live through a hundred days of work to pay this guy back. But the guy goes you got to pay me now. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, saying the same thing, have patience with me and I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So he had just been forgiven the impossible and now he refuses to forgive the possible. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed <clears throat> and reported to their master all that had taken place. Now remember, this is a fellow servant within the kingdom fellow believers, okay, and that we owe our Lord everything, and we know what he's forgiven us, but someone asks us to forgive them, and what do we do? Because of hurt feelings, because we feel like an injustice has been done, because of the pain that it's caused us, we don't forgive quite so easily. In fact, we don't forgive at all most of the time. We hold a lot of grudges. So then his master summoned him and said to him, so the servants, let's go back a minute, the servants, they see what's happened, and they go tell the king. If you see another brother, another Christian, and they have unjustly treated another Christian, what do you do about that? Now, there's up uh, earlier in the chapter, they talk about if, if they've offended in the church and you take one for you go and ask them, then you take someone with you and you ask them to change. And if they don't, what's going to happen? But what about us? What about us individually? What is our responsibility when we see another believer who is acting unjustly toward another believer? Well, the first thing I'd suggest you do is pray about whether you should say anything or not. There are hills to die on and there are hills. It's not your job, okay? But sometimes we need to ask the Lord, do I need to say anything? I literally have had people in my life confront me and they were right. And I don't know if I told this in here, but years ago when First Baptist decided to go to uh, two Sunday schools, I didn't think they should. Okay, but I didn't stand up and tell Brother John I didn't think they should, but I didn't think they should. So one Sunday morning, I'm sitting out in the lobby, 
uh, talking to a friend and we're talking about the fact that pretty soon we're going to go to these two Sunday schools and how are we going to work all this out and what are we going to do and I, I was expressing my opinion that I just thought it was a bad idea I didn't think we should do it I didn't think anything about it so I had a friend good friend here who uh, called me and she said I need to tell you something it was in the week after that and I said, what? And she said, well, I was at church Sunday night, and she said, I have a friend I've really been trying to get to meet you. I want her to meet you. And she said, we were going down the hall, and I saw you coming the other way, and I said to her, oh, there's my friend Carol. I really want you to meet her. And she said, her friend said to her, I don't want to meet her. And she, I, and, and she said, I asked her why. Why wouldn't you want to meet her? And she said, because I heard her talking in the lobby of the church Sunday morning. And I don't think she had a right to do that. My Christian friend confronted me with what I'd done. And thankfully, it was one of the rare times when I took it better. <laughs> so I, I said, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. But I lost the chance to meet someone she really thought would be a valuable friend. And I'm, I, I, I spoke when I should have not spoken. But I also had a Christian friend who was willing to confront me with it. So sometimes when we see another believer who is really not acting as they should, in love, at the Lord's direction, after prayer, sometimes we should say something because we may be the only one who's willing to do so. And I think that part of that is this. When these slaves saw that the other, or servants, saw that the other servant had been so mistreated, they went to the king and said, this is what's happened. And when the king found out, it says, verse 8, uh, 32, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So he is now reaping the consequences of his sin, which was a sin of unforgiveness. And then Jesus says at the end of it, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. One of the main lessons from this, of course, is unforgiveness. But one of the things we have to understand is that forgiveness is not an option for the believer. It's not an option. You don't get to choose. We are told to forgive. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy, and that doesn't mean you haven't been hurt, and it doesn't mean that things have happened that should not have been happened. You are the offended party if you're the one that needs to forgive. But Jesus, who was perfect and loved us enough to die for us and forgave us so much, wants us to follow his example. And his example is to forgive. And I think I told this before, but I, I, hold, I didn't think I held grudges. I thought I was one of those wonderful people who never held grudges. And I really kind of pat myself on the back about it. And then I saw um, a man here at church that had offended not really me, but a friend of mine years before in a situation I was in. And all these years I had held a grudge against him, but didn't know it. And he was here at church, and I... I said something to Frank on the way home. I was just going, he hears all of this. I was going on and on and on about uh, this guy and how I, I just didn't like him. And he just let me talk, because he always does that. He let me talk. When I finally ran out of breath, he looked at me and quietly said, holding a grudge, huh? <laughs> and I looked at him and said, I don't hold. And I got about that far, and I thought, he's right. I am holding a grudge. I have been offended at someone. And I hadn't seen this man in years. And I'm still holding a grudge. We don't get a choice. We have to ask God's forgiveness for that. And we have to, we have to forgive when we are asked to forgive. Uh, when we ask someone to forgive us, it is then out of our hands. Whether they forgive us or not is out of our hands. But we are to ask to be forgiven. And on the opposite side of that, when someone asks us to forgive, we are to forgive. Okay, do we have to forget? Yes and no. We have to forget the offense. We have to forget the, the, the pain. We have to let it go, you know, frozen and all that. Um, but at the same time, there's a lesson to be learned. 
And I was very angry at the Lord for a long time because he said that he buried our sins in the sea of forgetfulness and remembered them no more. And I thought that was awful because he could forget, but I couldn't. (laughs) And I really remember saying to him one day, I don't think that's fair. You get to forget all I've done. So why can't I forget? I don't want to remember all my sins either, if it's okay. And clearly I heard him say, clearly, because I don't need the lesson and you do. (laughs) part of the lesson in forgiving is remembering so that we go and sin no more part of the lesson in forgiving is saying I need to not walk that path anymore so we do need to remember the situation but we have to remember it through the lens of already forgiven because that's what we're supposed to do Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like is uh, the kingdom of heaven is not finished yet, by the way, because he hasn't returned and all the sin in the world isn't gone yet. Okay, so it's not finished. But within the kingdom of heaven, among our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to offend each other once in a while. And we go to a big church, so there's more people to offend and to be offended by <laughs> than a small one is not so limited. So both of those things are going to happen. But in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of heaven, we're supposed to forgive. And we're supposed to forgive because his intention is to reconcile. And that's another part of this parable. He's looking for reconciliation among us because we're to reflect Christ. And when we do not get along, it does not reflect Christ. Uh, I've told you before about the Victory Baptist Church in Pueblo that got in a fist fight out on the street one Sunday morning over whether the pastor should stay or not. And everybody still talks about it. And it happened before I moved here 47 years ago. You know, when we do not act like Christ, then we are not doing what we're supposed to do. So not only do we forgive, but we reconcile. We walk together in, in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is the one that sought us out. He saw the treasure that we were to be, his treasure, and he gave up his life for us. He saw that pearl that was so valuable that he was willing to give up his life for us. But then once we're in the kingdom, we're expected to act like we've been forgiven all that stuff. And he's given up his life for us. We're supposed to keep that in the forefront of our mind, not our own rights. Heard someone say one time, as believers, we don't actually have, uh, there is no independence in the church. There is dependence on God and interdependence among the believers. We have to demonstrate that interdependence, that inner faith, that inner fellowship, and that inner walking. And we do that because we forgive, even when we're offended by those that really we were hoping would be the least likely to offend us. So, we who are in the kingdom of heaven must live in the light of his great love and forgiveness. How could we do any less? Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for who you are. And thank you that we live within your kingdom. And the boundaries that are set are not hard and that you have been the perfect example. Help us to walk with you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.